So this is, as I said, is a joint event between our UK and the Open Repositories Conference. And we see this as an opportunity to share reflections on the repository infrastructure. We have two talks. The first one will be delivered by Professor Hussein Suleiman, whose research is situated in the Digital Libraries Laboratory in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Cape Town. Professor Suleiman gave the closing keynote at the Open Repositories Conference in 2023. And the talk that we see today will build on that and is meant to really inspire, but also to challenge us and to encourage us to think broadly about the ways repositories enable discoverability and interoperability globally. And then teasing ahead for a little bit later, the second talk will be from Stefano Kosu from Harvard University. Stefano will share key takeaways and updates on Harvard's digital repository services futures project. The digital repository services has provided preservation and access services for Harvard's library and archival collections for well over 20 years. And even though it was a really cutting edge project when it started, it has over that time obviously aged and is now due for a redesign, which at the complexity and size is a major institutional challenge affecting many departments across Harvard and very large external users and their data. So in the second talk that we come to a little bit later, Stefano will introduce us to the approach um, that they've taken, not just when it comes to technology and production practices, but also to the modes of collaboration and information gathering. And now to get out of your uh, way uh, and open the stage uh, for Hussein, just as a brief introduction, he is the Dean of Sciences at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. As I mentioned before, his research is based in the Department of Computer Science in a digital libraries laboratory. Um, with a particular focus on digital libraries, ICT4D, African language information retrieval, cultural heritage preservation, internet technology, and education technology. He's in the past worked extensively on architecture, scalability, and interoperability issues related to digital library systems, and also work closely with international and national partnerships for metadata archiving, including the Open Archives Initiative, Network Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations, and the NRF uh, Chelsea South African National Electronic Thesis Project. His recent re research has a growing emphasis on the relationship between low resource environments and digital library architectures. This has evolved into a focus on societal development and its alignment with digital libraries and information retrieval. And he's currently collaborating with various colleagues in Digital Humanities Group to develop a proof of concept and experimental low resource software toolkit for digital repositories. And with that introduction, I think, uh, Hussein, I'd like to ask you to now uh, turn your camera on, and then I'll hand the virtual stage over to you. Uh, so thank you, Torsten, once again. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present this talk as part of this event. And I, and I also should start by saying thank you to the various colleagues who posted where you are from. Um, I even noticed some people from my part of the world, uh, but I noticed that people who are attending this come from all over the world. So uh, hopefully we get some interesting discussion and some perspectives on this as we go along. So I have titled this De Designing Repositories in Poor Countries. Um, and this is meant to be a bit provocative. And the question that you might ask is why am I focusing on, on, on poor countries and how does this actually apply to people all over the world? How does it apply to the UK for those colleagues who are from the UK? And I'm hoping that the beginning and end of this talk will somehow sandwich together the, the answer to that question, um, where going from a problem in one space, we want to try to address something that has more uh, global applicability. So um, I could probably skip why I am here and who I am. <laughs> I think Torsten covered most of this. I've worked in various different digital library projects for a long time. I have to say like many people, many computer scientists who work in this area, you start off by thinking that you know exactly what to do. And uh, maybe after a few decades, you realize that you, you really don't know what you're doing. And uh, this needs quite a lot of thought. And uh, this is what I am currently doing. Um, and you know, maybe in 10 years from now, I'll re realize that we take that one step further. So starting off, this, this talk is 
uh, very similar to what I what I gave at Open Repositories 2023. Well, I, or, or to be more accurate, the slides are very similar. What I say will not necessarily be similar because some things have changed since then, but not a whole lot. So some questions that came up at Open Repositories 2023 that I thought uh, may frame some of the conversations here. Is Africa different? So I'm in, I'm in South Africa. Um, are the needs of repository repositories or the needs of institutions different if you happen to live within some kind of a poor country? Or can you simply use the same solution like everyone else? Can you use DOIs like everyone else? I've got some very interesting reactions to that particular question at Open Repositories. Um, or do we need different solutions? And this is uh, an, a question that we always ask ourselves here when we are developing new technology and trying to solve problems that may be considered to be international problems. So I'll start off with what was a bit of a beginning for many people, um, or maybe a watershed moment in this space of digital repositories. The Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting this, this was developed around the end of the 1990s and beginning into the 2000s. It was a, a standard that was developed to transfer metadata from one place to another. And um, a lot of people would claim that this was very successful as a standard. Some people would call this the last truly international archive collaboration because there were people from all over the world who contributed to this. I once read a, a, a beautiful report by your, the United States NSF, uh, where it was evaluating the Digital Library Initiative uh, of the late 1990s. And they said there were two things that came out of that that were successful and everything else was pretty much had failed, Google and OAI PMH. Well, you know, I'm not, not sure I necessarily agree with OAI PMH part, but, um, but it was considered to be a success where lots of the things that we were doing were pretty hit or miss. So people were building repositories, they were building experimental systems, and we weren't really sure what people were learning from this. So why, why, why did we come up with this OEI PMH? The reasons for this are, are still pertinent to the discussion that we're having today. And the discussion we're having today is about reflecting on repository toolkits. So when OEI PMH was, was designed, it was spurred on by a couple of interesting things happening. The first thing was a change in the commercialization model of journals, where we had large companies that were starting to increase the prices of journals. And of course, this is still happening, right? So the what was called the serials crisis of the 1990s. And what people wanted to do was they wanted to build some kind of infrastructure that would help them to address the serials crisis. Centralization wasn't really working. So people were trying to think of, of different kinds of solutions. So the third thing here was the failure of federation. So there were some early attempts at trying to build decentralized systems where you could build archives in various different places and connect them together, but these didn't really work. We needed something that was somehow simpler which was an interesting problem to attempt to solve. At the same time, what we also want to do is we want to divide up the space and say that, well, if you own the data, somebody else could provide services. So somehow we wanted to separate this even further. The notion that behind all of this was that we had very simple components that were connected together in order to constitute the repository infrastructure. This was kind of thinking behind OEI PMH. So, the, eventually, the protocol that was released well, had a few um, attributes that I think are quite important because these are attributes that were influenced by what was happening in the repository space. And so arguably, if this was successful, people should be carrying these attributes through into all kinds of other developments. So something that's flexible, generic, doesn't use a lot of resources, is robust to failure. So if something fails, you can just go in there and, and, and basically do it again. It was designed so that it should work anywhere in the world. Um, I know that I uh, famously stood up a few times and said that particular suggestion will not work in Africa, so we're not going to do that. Um, and so we threw out some ideas that seemed like they were good ideas at the time, because in the late 1990s, 
we, we didn't have very good network infrastructure all over the world, and this had to work everywhere. And then we had this little principle that we never wrote into any papers, but we said that the standard should be such that if you get a skilled developer, a software developer, they should be able to write the code to implement the standard in one day. And if it takes more than a day, then we've done something wrong. And this was the, the benchmark. So in fact, over, over the years when this was being developed, there were, there were various different versions and we could churn these out really quickly because this was all simple. Well, at least that's what we thought in those days. So what happened next? Well, we all know what happened next. People started building repository toolkits and lots of people tried to provide services. There was the open access movement going on. There are open repository conferences. There are events like this where we are talking about this. Um, and lots of people are basically um, attempting to set up repositories for various different purposes. So there, so there has been success in the repository movement to a large degree. But coming back to South Africa, right? So coming back to the, the example of the poor country. If you're in a poor country, does is this all uh, a runaway success, like I, I was just suggesting? Well, I can't remember where I got this graphic from. Um, but there are some numbers in this that are very worrying. I think the, the one that I, I really want to point out was the, is that this particular figure says that in the year that this was produced, there were there was 22.39 million people in the labor force and 7.51 million people who were unemployed. This is a very high unemployment rate. And it gives you a sense that although the country may have maybe very good infrastructure for tourists, uh, it is still effectively a very poor country. A large number of the people are extremely poor in the country. And, and this is possibly the, the strongest economy on the African continent. So the rest of the countries on the African continent um, have very, very little resources to spare for what might be seen as a luxury, you know, preserving your culture or, or preserving the knowledge produced in your institutions. So what do we do about it? Well, there are some approaches that people have taken, which I find quite fascinating. The first one is when we look at something like the Nelson Mandela archive and exhibition. This is a collection of documents, images, etc., related to the first president of the democratic South Africa, who, and, um, who is known all over the world. And these digital objects were archived in collaboration with Google Arts and Culture, with funding from international donors. I think Google actually provided funding as well. So the Nelson Mandela Foundation was able to go out in the world and say, okay, we have all this important stuff, who's gonna help us with it? And everybody put up their hands and it was done. But this is not the case for all digital repositories. So there are lots of other things that are probably as important, if not more important, but for which we can't easily acquire the resources. So there were two examples that I like to quote. The first is something called the South African Digitization Initiative with a terrible acronym, which starts off with SAD. Um, the South African Digitization Initiative was effectively an attempt to build something like Europeana. And we resisted the urge to call it Africana or South Africana. But it was supposed to be an attempt to build repositories all over the country, connect them together, and uh, provide information to people on all kinds of different things. Um, and I managed to find the, the homepage of this project. It has nothing on it because the project didn't really get anywhere at all. Um, and, and so this is the question to ask. So what happened? Why did this not work? The second example that I like to use is South African National ETD Project. The last time I gave a talk, uh, this project still existed. Um, at this point, I, I think the project exists as a, as a concept, uh, but uh, the portal where you could, in fact, access items in repositories is no longer active. This has gone dormant and somebody is going to take over at some point, I hope and try to resuscitate this. So what happened? Well, this is a classic problem that seems to occur over and over again in poor countries. Don't have money, we don't have time, we don't have the skilled people, we don't have the institutions that can serve as hosts for these projects. And 
we are lacking the resources to get things off the ground, to keep things running, and to deal with it when something uh, happens. So collectively, we refer to these as low resource environments. Now, low resource environments can occur anywhere in the world. A lot of countries in Africa could, could by default call those low resource environments, but there are places all over the world that can be low resource environments. They can be, you, know, you could be in the middle of New York City and there could be some NGO that's trying to establish an important collection as an archive, but it can't do this because it doesn't have the funding. So this is a, an all pervasive problem. We have lots of these low resource environments and how do we deal with this when we are trying to build repositories? Well, there's a lot of problems that can happen. The first thing here is you could have archives that are shut down. Like I was just talking about the South African National ETD portal. Uh, it's, not, it's not really the archive, it was the portal, but it, it's pretty much not, not operational at the moment. Um, it's even worse, there may be thesis archives that have been set up in some universities and the university decides to stop funding it and the, and the archive disappears one day. Um, then there are archives that are severely at risk of being shut down, where the rock art data archive, for example, just narrowly managed to keep running by getting some last one donation from somebody so that they could uh, keep licensing the software they were using. And then there are notions of digital divides. So people who may have archives, and this is a, a criticism that's often leveled at people in South Africa, that we have archives for various things that we are doing. You go to our neighboring countries and some of them have nothing. Um, and this is a problem. Then another problem we have in low resource environments is we rely a lot on external providers. So at the institution that I am at, now I'm at, I'm at the University of Cape Town, which um, according to some people is the, the top institution on, on the continent. Um, but do we have resources? You could say we are one of the better resourced institutions. However, we don't have the staff who know how to run a repository. So we use Atmaya for one of our repositories and we use Figshare for the other one because there are no people here who know what to do um, in order to set up and manage these things. And this is a, a bit of a concern. And then of course we have the case where there may simply be no archive and this seems to happen quite often. So how do we deal with this? What do, what do we do to, to somehow address this problem? I'm not a big fan of custom solutions. I think what we need is open source software maybe, but does the open source software actually work? So is it okay to just say, well, uh, we all, you have all these software toolkits, they're open source, you can use them. I know a lot of people who have tried to use them and they were told, well, it's open source, so you can change it any way you want to, um, but they didn't have the skilled personnel in order to change this. So I've spent some time trying to deal with these things and I think I've, at some point in my life set up repositories using all these software tools. And I found that in many cases, these things are not really that easy to use. It's not that easy to, to adopt, to adapt it to your specific circumstances. And maybe it's just a bit too complicated. So is there possibly a better way of designing this? How are these tools designed? What principles did they use when they designed these tools? I'm not convinced that there were strong principles underlying the design of most repository toolkits. And this has led me to do the research I've been doing for the last five years. So one of the things that I started off working on was something called the Bleak and Lloyd Collection. And the Bleak and Lloyd Collection was a project that I worked on from way back in 2006, where this was a collection of documents related to the original, uh, the history of the original inhabitants of the area that I live in now. And these documents were absolutely critical to the history of the country. And somebody had decided that, well, we need to distribute this far and wide, make sure that this thing is going to survive whatever catastrophe and that everybody has a copy of it. So we wanted this to be distributed on a DVD that we could hand out to lots and lots of people. And it turns out that very few repository tools will allow you to do something like that. And in fact, lots of the software approaches to, to building 
a collection as something that can be distributed on a standalone DVD didn't really work. So I spent a lot of time experimenting with alternative ways of building digital repositories as part of this bleak and white collection. And then I noticed that other people had run into the same problem. So Greenstone, for example, was attempting to create archives that could be distributed on CD-ROM. And as I looked into this further, I found that, well, people that I, that I had known about for a long time had been thinking about this from slightly different angles, like Project Gutenberg, where there was a decision taken that everything was going to be in a very simple format. And then there was the LOX project that said that, well, uh, let's assume everything's going to, to go wrong at some point in time, and we make lots of copies and distribute this, and, and maybe that will help to, to preserve information. So putting all these things together, uh, I spent some time trying to do an analysis and look across all of these different solutions to see what was common. And in my research group, we came up with a set of principles and said, well, maybe we should be designing systems on the basis of a set of design principles. For example, we only create a system, as much system as we need. We don't have a, a complex software system at the back end. We don't want users to, to have to go through all kinds of additional steps, like logging into a system, unless it's, unless they absolutely need to. And, and I say that I have to say that many online systems today are doing this. The third question was something that's very specific to poor countries. It should work even when you're offline, but as much of it as possible should work when you're offline, um, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a few of these design principles here. I'm not going to talk about all of them. The one, the one that I want to, to particularly focus on is this notion of preservation. At the end of the day, we want to have some sort of digital preservation. And I think this is the starting point. We want to preserve the information. But I think that uh, quite often we think about how we can plan for preservation. I think we want to invert this and think about what do we do when disaster strikes? So how do we design our systems so that they can be easily rescued? Because I'm not yet convinced that any solution anybody has come up with for digital preservation actually works. What I think is more likely is that some systems are going to be rescuable to a greater degree than other systems. And so I think designing for rescue is, or is probably the better approach to take. So there were some technical solutions and I'll just uh, mention some of these quickly. Um, in, in trying to, to build on these principles, what we asked was, okay, now that we know, we know what we're aiming for, how do we build actual systems? The one thing we have played around with for a long time is not having a database. Uh, all that you that you store is XML files containing metadata and, and other things in hierarchical directories. And there is no central database or database management system. The question is how much can you get done using this approach? It turns out you can do a lot without an actual database. The second thing is, do you have to, to run any kind of software when somebody is trying to access your repository? Or can you just pre-generate everything? And, uh, and this comes from other software systems that have done this before, like even the ePrint software that was produced in the UK had this notion that you could pre-generate parts of your system. And what this does is, is it reduces the resource requirements on, for the user who's trying to access your system, it makes it more scalable, it makes it easier to rescue. So this seemed like something we, were, we really wanted to do. The other thing that we tried to do, and I think was quite successful, was we decided that we didn't really want the server either. So could we move, as any processing that had to happen, could we move that to the user's end and have that operating in the browser? And as time has gone by, what we have in our web browsers is a fairly advanced execution engine. This is no longer just something to look at HTML pages. This is something that can run programs that will do some processing for you. So we can do a lot of the processing at the user end, which means we don't have to do it in the server end. So putting these ideas together, we proposed that if we simplify the design of archives, it may address a lot of problems. It will be less costly, faster, can be maintained easily, et cetera. We want simple archives. So I've spent the last five to six years now 
working on this on on the principles that are embodied by a toolkit called Simple DL, which is a toolkit to create simple archives. And there are lots of ideas that have come out of digital libraries research that are somehow embedded into this particular toolkit, and it's experimental. So there's there's a GitHub uh, URL there where anybody can go in there and and uh, grab the code and play around with it. It's meant to be something that we're not necessarily going to put into production on a wide scale, but hopefully something that can help us to think about the design of repositories. And I will talk about some of the features of this. So it's, it's a typical repository toolkit. It does things that typical repository toolkits do, but some of them it does differently. So the first thing is it's an offline pre-generated website. So almost every page that you go to on this repository is pre-generated and offline. So it's not running through any kind of a software system. You could you could copy the whole page offline and, and it would still work if you ran this off something like a, like a USB stick. The faceted search system is entirely built into JavaScript. So there isn't some server software that's running this. And this was because if we gave this to, to somebody on a USB stick and they ran it on their computer, they needed to be able to, to navigate through the collection as well and, and to do some, some operations in that we would that we would consider to be discovery operations, even though the entire collection is offline. The third major feature here is that we we use data formats that are really, really basic, XML files and metadata stored in spreadsheets. And uh, some people would ask, you know, why did you not use JSON? And in fact, at open repositories, people ask, why did you not use JSON? Um, there isn't a strong reason, you know, JSON and XML can be uh, converted between, from one to the other fairly easily. Um, but we wanted to keep this in a format that people could understand. And uh, something I learned a long time ago is that people, especially people in the digital humanities who I work with uh, more closely, understand spreadsheets. They don't understand these fancy web-based structured data organization systems. So they understand spreadsheets. I can ask them to deal with metadata in spreadsheets and they can um, they can create something that can be ingested into a system. And most of the rest of this is typical features of repositories. So I'm gonna talk about that. And the basic idea here um, is that we start off with metadata in some kind of a CSV file, which is, is a spreadsheet format. And then we convert it into XML. And then from the XML, we convert this into HTML. It's a two-step process. Along the way, we create an index. And this is it. There are, there are three executable files that uh, are currently part of the system. One is called import, one is called generate, and one is called index. And I'm resisting the urge to create any more software within this particular system. <clears throat> what we have done, though, is we have extended this at some point so that um, you can add comments as well, but it's, it all fits into the same framework. So um, I, I probably don't want to say too much about this. There is an interface. Um, after building the first version of this, somebody said, well, um, we don't really know how to use the command line, which was, was obviously where many things start. And so I added on a, you know, a Sunday afternoon, one, one year, I added on a simple web interface so that you could upload your CSV files. Um, and uh, then somebody wanted to log in. So we added in user accounts and entities and authority records. And, and all of this is done as simply as we could possibly do it. So the, every new feature that was added, I have to say, has probably added you know, uh, on the order of 10 to 20 lines of code in order to add something. Because the whole goal was to keep the amount of code to a minimum. Uh, what we wanted was something that could that could not increase the complexity beyond what was absolutely needed. And at some point, we had attachment annotations that you could um, create that were uh, attached to objects within the system as well. So um, the search and browse was the interesting feature because it ran completely in JavaScript, and this is just a picture of what it what the interface looks like in one of the systems, where there's a number of facets on the left hand side. There's a query box at the top, and there's a list of results on the right. And this is dynamic. It will reorganize this when you choose facets or you change the query, and it's entirely running within the browser. So 
usually when you come up with some kind of stupid idea, like let's build a repository without actually being online, the first thing people are going to say is this won't work. So I spent some time trying to do evaluations to ask, well, how scalable is this? And we ran a lot of experiments where uh, between myself and my students, we looked at the amount of time it took for the generation of results for users to interact with the system, especially things like searching without actually connecting to a server somewhere. And it turns out that yes, if you have a very large amount of data that you need to process on your desktop computer or your laptop, it's going to take more time. But we calculated that, and, and this must have been, I would say, six, six or seven years ago, um, we could deal with about, about 100,000 items in a second. And the user would never notice. In fact, no user had ever come back to me yet to say that uh, this seems like it's slow. Why is it slow? I have not yet heard this. So we could deal with 100,000 items in, in less than a second. And uh, and this means, and, and so I should actually qualify this. It's 100,000 matches. It's not 100,000 items. There could be tens of millions of items, but it's 100,000 matches for the search query. And we thought this was not bad, right? So how many people have um, collections that are more than 100,000 items? Well, lots of people. But, but how many people have smaller collections? It turns out that there are lots of people who have smaller collections who just haven't started figuring out what they want to do with their collection yet. And, and this is something that we really need to think about. And, and since then, I've worked on a lot of case studies. And the case studies have been to demonstrate that we can look at slightly different domains, maybe, and build repositories using a similar approach. So the first case study is something called Emandulo, and you can search for this and you can find it. And, and please do, please have a look at the, uh, the website for Emandulo. And it will, it will show you that it looks like a relatively slick digital repository system. It's all running on the simple DL software. So that basically means that your entire experience is static. It's all been pre-generated. There's almost nothing that you are doing on the system that is dynamic. The only time it becomes dynamic is if you log in and you want to post a comment. Um, and these are just other screen snapshots. I'm not going to look at this. I'll just skip over that. The second uh, case study is the new Blick and Lloyd collection. And new Blick and Lloyd collection is the system going back uh, 17 years, what we are trying to do is we're trying to retrofit uh, the data. We're trying to take the data from there and put it into this new system uh, to see what, if this can be done easily and if we can take a slightly different conceptual view of a repository and still use the same software toolkit. Because the software toolkit doesn't do a whole lot. It's it's a lot about the the skin on, on the website and a lot about the collection and how it's represented. There's a lot of flexibility there. All you need to do is change a few style sheets and you can change the entire appearance. Now, I'm no good at design. These have all been designed. The, the look and feel has been done by professional designers. And the last case, and this is part of the Bleak and Light collection, the last case is looking at very typical documents. So this is the Network Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations where there's a conference every year, and every year there's a number of papers that have been uh, presented. And so we use the same software in with almost the default settings in order to archive the papers for that particular series of conferences, because we just wanted to have another separate archive for this. And this looks more like a metadata-based repository where every item has a PDF file, the thumbnail, and some kind of metadata related to it. So what do we get out of all of this? Right? Where does all of this take us? After having built these systems and thought about this quite a lot, there's, there's a few reflections that I want to share. So the first is, I'm not trying to build a new repository toolkit. So the idea here is that we want to change the way in which people are building repositories. It would be nice if people could quickly create new archives for small collections. Because if you only have your family photos, for example, why do you need to go up and install DSpace? Or why do you need to give your photos to some online service, which means that some AI tool is gonna pick it up as well, right? So you may not necessarily want to do that. The second thing here is, this is not an attempt to solve everyone's problems. It's gonna solve some people's problems and some other people may need to look for other solutions. But it's also meant to be 
the beginning of a space for experimentation. And everybody who I work with, I started by letting them know that this is experimental. It's for us to think about repositories. And eventually, you're probably going to have to submit your data to some larger collection um, that is based at the institution or, or something like that. The one note at the bottom about this not being a solution for all problems is, is quite important. If I was designing a repository toolkit for millions of objects, I'm going to take a different approach to it because at that scale, the software approach will be different. And this is a lesson we learned from Google a long time ago, that when the size of the problem changes, then the fundamental algorithms and the approach that you take may need to be different. So it's not one solution for all problems. So we've done some experiments in recent years. Uh, I think every point on this slide is referring to the work that's, that was done by one of my graduate or postgraduate students. The last one, however, is what I've been doing since open repositories. So I'll say more about this. And you know, after you after you spend a lot of time theorizing on uh, or trying to figure out what principles should be used for, the, for building software systems, and then you build software systems to validate the principles. The next question is, well, do we need to do the same thing for every other kind of software system that's out there? So let's say tomorrow somebody decides that, well, the learning management systems that universities use, well, we need to have principles for building learning management systems as well. Um, and this seems like you know you, we, we're going to reinvent the wheel quite quickly, and then we uh, as, as software engineers would stop and say, hang on, we need uh, more generalizable patterns for design. So we've we've spent the last few months, uh, in fact, probably quite a bit of the last year, looking at developing design patterns where we can specify a standardized approach that can be used for developing software systems that can be used in low resource environments, and that can then be specialized for the development of digital repositories in these environments. So finally, some, some ending provocative statements. Um, do we really need these repository toolkits that are complex? Uh, I have to say it's been a long time since I've used DSpace myself. I like DSpace, it works. I have had DSpace go really, really badly wrong once. And that has made me wonder if it's something that I really should be using. Uh, I also wonder a lot about the commercialization of repository services. The fact that my own university can't seem to operate repositories by itself and has to go to some company somewhere else in the world seems like the wrong solution altogether. And I think this is not just about repository services, it's about software systems used at institutions in general. Um, and then, of course, there's a question of colonization of, of, of knowledge. Well, I think this is and this is a, a very difficult issue, and, and, and we could be here all day talking about this. But do you really put all of your data into some kind of repository that is physically located elsewhere in the world? Uh, how do you know what's going to happen to your data? Is your data going to be fed into the next greatest uh, large language model that's being produced by some AI company? Um, and, and what, is, what laws are you, is your data going to be subject to? So in South Africa, we think about this a lot. Um, and uh, you know our, our universities will insist that data is stored only in certain countries if you're going to use online services. And I don't know how many people think about that. Then I, I find that the way in which people engage with data is something that is evolving and, and it's really not settled in any sense at all. So the digital humanities people that I work with constantly come back to me and constantly, I mean, every month, they come back to me with some new idea or some new perspective on how the repository works. And it's not possible for me to use some stable general open source tool in order to allow them to think through the issues that they are presenting. But I can do this fairly quickly with a simple tool because the simple tool needs a few changes here and there. And we can test some idea. Then the next reflection here is that uh, when we think of these archives, I think it's very important to realize that this is not the final place where that object is going to be located. 
that the object is definitely going to be somewhere else at some point in time. It's just a question of time. And it's a question of uh, when somebody has the will to, to relocate those particular objects. So in some sense, the, this is all um, a temporary location. And we need to, to think about this in the design of our systems. And then, of course, we are not all online. And, and finally, there's a lot of compromises to make. Rescuing, I think, is very important. We must be able to rescue the data. Scalability, a lot of people think scalability is the most important thing. But in fact, the digital preservation in many instances is far more important than building a system that can scale to millions of objects. If you can't preserve the 50,000 most important digital objects to your country, who cares if you can build a system to access everyone else's data, right? And this is the perspective that, that I think uh, is, is something that, that applies to us where I work. The, the next thing here is, you know, if we can build these things quickly, and the reason why the South African version of Europeana did not work, if we can build a small archives quickly, we could do some experiments with collaboration. We could look at how we connect these things together and build a repository infrastructure on a larger scale. But if we can't build the granular archives relatively simply, we're never going to get off the ground. So in fact, one of the reasons uh, why I worked on this project, and why I'm still working on this project, is because the attempt to create a South African version of Europeana failed because we didn't have any archives to start off with in the first place. And we didn't have the skills to start installing archive tools all over the place. And lastly, if you think about resource limits, I'd like to think that we'll end up with different solutions. And these different solutions may solve the problems in, in my part of the world, but I'm hoping that what we're going to do is we're going to contribute ideas that will actually result in better solutions for everyone, because anything that is simpler and that is going to use less resources is going to be a solution. That's going to be a solution that the whole world could potentially benefit from. So there are some references at the end. Thank you for listening. Um, I have my details on the last slide and I will hand back to the chair. Well, thank you so much for, for giving the talk and from sort of bringing the perspective that you have on the countries that you work with to the global scale at the end. Uh, I already have a lot of questions, um, but we at this point, I think said that we um, put a pen into those. Um, and move on to the second speaker, and then we can have a discussion with both panelists later. But as a reminder, if you have any questions um, that you want to ask of the panel, put them into the Q&A function at the bottom, and we'll pick them up later. And I'm now inviting Stefano to come on screen. And as a quick introduction, he joined Harvard in 2022 as the Digital Repository Architect for the Repository Futures. This is a task force in charge of reimagining and re-engineering the university library's digital preservation system. And before he had this current role, Stefano worked as software architect at the Getty Trust and as director of application services and collections at the Art Institute of Chicago. In all of these roles, Stefano has researched and promoted community-supported technology, sustainable practices, and the focus on cultural heritage and academic challenges in IT. He's also been an active participant in communities, including IIIF, Fedora, Sambero, OCFL, um, at the technical community, but also strategic level for over a decade. So with that introduction, Stefano, I'm handing over to you and um, the stage is yours. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the DRS project at Harvard uh, University. Um, I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, and it's um, it's interesting how uh, Professor Suleiman's um, and my presentation were uh, put together. Uh, so we're going to to talk from you know uh, from talking about uh, low resource uh, countries and institutions to an institution that has a lot of resources. Uh, you know, Harvard Library has uh, has the money, has the uh, skilled labor, and the most important thing, we had buy in for uh, a major uh, a repository and digital preservation services service. And uh, 
surprisingly, we ran into a lot of uh, constraints. Uh, we had to make many hard choices. So uh, my conclusion was that no matter how much money you have, uh, you, you'll always run short and you have to make uh, hard, hard choices. So um, as a preface, um, uh, I have to say that we are still in an RFP um, uh, negotiation process. So I can't share many of the details uh, of, the, of the process, but I'll focus on, uh, on, the, um, on the principles and on the, on the approach to, to many of the problems that we encountered during uh, this, uh, this process. So uh, a short word about the DRS, Digital Repository Service. Uh, it's a, a digital preservation and a digital repository uh, software that was established first in 2000 by Harvard Library. Um, it is uh, entirely built in-house because uh, back uh, in 2000, there were no uh, viable digital preservation solutions. And it also needed to address very specific and complex need of uh, UIT, which is a uh, Harvard University IT. Uh, today, uh, it's uh, DRS counts about 10 million object, uh, objects and uh, 900 million uh, replicated files across uh, four different uh, storage backends uh, that total uh, about uh, two petabytes uh, of replicated data. Uh, we have users across campus uh, coming from uh, 63 departments uh, that um, use uh, DRS for uh, many different types of uh, objects and, uh, and uh, digital files. And uh, DRS is currently actively supported. Uh, however, as, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's aging and it has uh, many uh, shortcomings, uh, including uh, you know, growing technical debt. Uh, you can imagine how much technical debt we have accumulated in uh, 24 years. Um, uh, especially uh, the, the content model uh, that uh, it's built upon is very inflexible, uh, even just to add, uh, say, a file type to a content model for allowing a, a new file type to, to be ingested uh, takes uh, a, a fair amount of labor. Uh, the UI, the the user experience overall is uh, quite uh, inefficient uh, because uh, it, it's built upon uh, uh, very old libraries, very old uh, software that um, uh, is not fit for today's uh, expectations and workflows. Um, so all of this uh, led to um, to. Um, starting the DRS Futures project, um, which is a three-year three -year, uh, capital funded, funded research in design and implementation project to completely um, rethink, redesign, and re-implement DRS from the ground up. Uh, the project is uh, divided in three phases. Uh, phase one uh, was the discovery phase that ran from July 2022 to June 2023. Uh, the second phase is planning um, uh, that goes from uh, 20, July 2023 to uh, February 24th. And the third phase is, is the implementation phase that goes from March 24th to June 25th. Uh, during this process, we are we have been open uh, to, to implementing different uh, options for, for our new repository. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, commercial solutions, uh, open source software, and even home-built solutions. Uh, this uh, is for uh, Harvard Library an opportunity to uh, re envision digital preservation as a whole, uh, not just to re implement some software based on, uh, um, on the, the concept of digital preservation from 20 years ago. Um, the DRS Futures team um, is a, is a it's a joint team from the uh, from UIT and uh, and Harvard Library members. Uh, who have uh, you know different uh, skill sets, uh, different seniority levels, and come from different uh, walks of life. Uh, so we are uh, we are a very heterogeneous uh, group, um, uh, and we largely interact as peers. We don't have a, an, an appointed formal uh, team lead, uh, so we we uh, make decisions uh, as a as a with the group as a whole. And uh, we are connected uh, with many involved departments, especially during the first phase where uh, we, we solicited uh, feedback from stakeholders. Um, we have been uh, uh, doing a lot of outreach and also the out this outreach um, ex uh, extends beyond 
uh, Harvard, uh, you know, into the community uh, with with events like uh, such as this one. Uh, the team is uh, very collaborative. Uh, as I mentioned, we we make uh, decisions together, but we also spin off occasional task forces for uh, uh, for specific uh, topics. So uh, the the problem of uh, redesigning and uh, and rethinking uh, DRS futures uh, was uh, approached from from two sides. One uh, that what we call inductive, so from the bottom up, and the, the other one is deductive from the top down. Um, from a bottom up uh, approach, we um, we conducted um, interviews with uh, different uh, departments uh, that um, focused on those departments' needs and and their workflows. Uh, how how do things? How how they do things? How they. Um, uh, deposit uh, things, how to retrieve uh, objects, and how do they search, and, and so on. Uh, also, there were uh, department focus groups uh, that were uh, they were uh, they were focused on uh, on specific topics or areas that are common uh, to to different departments. So to to find out uh, common patterns uh, across different departments. In addition to that, we held office hours that we had a, a com an entirely free format. Uh, we just uh, you know, log on to a, a Zoom session and let anybody uh, in who wanted to talk about uh, DRS futures uh, or DRS, uh, sorry, uh, the legacy DRS and how they would envision uh, DRS features. Uh, on the other hand, we had a, also a, a top-down uh, approach where uh, we uh, built from our previous experience with DRS and uh, uh, that allowed us to set up a digital reservation foundation Foundations uh, from a you know from a technical and and a strategic uh, standpoint, and also draft the long term vision uh, that was uh, independent from the the current state of DRS. Um, and that uh, also uh, prompted us to anticipate challenges of a of a more capable system and of uh, you know based on the growth of uh, on the of a, of a future growth of uh, DRS and uh, the needs of a Harvard library. Uh, during phase one, um, we uh, we had uh, you know several uh, key points that we uh, we kind of focused on. Uh, one was uh, separating uh, storage and services, uh, separating the archive and the workspace, uh, automating tasks, and re envisioning uh, digital preservation. Um, also, revolving feedback and uh, building for future scale. And I'm gonna go on uh, over uh, each of these points in detail. So for the uh, separation of uh, storage and service, um, uh, we uh, ach actually achieved this uh, in 2022 uh, by migrating all uh, our data backend uh, to uh, an OCFL uh, layout. Um, that was a major achievement that took over a year uh, to, to transfer data. So we don't wanna do that again when uh, we uh, implement DRS features. Uh, the the goal for the RS features is to replace services and leave the uh, storage fabric intact. Uh, that is pretty much the the purpose of uh, implementing a CFL, which should be seen as an, um, uh, you know, a permanent, and persistent, uh, the, the most uh, valuable part of our repository. On top of which services, which are um, uh, which are um, perishable by by nature uh, can be replaced uh, at will, uh, and that was uh, a, a pretty uh, uh, that is a pretty tough challenge, but it's a, it's a possible challenge. Uh, another issue that we uh, we found found with uh, the current uh, DRS is that uh, some departments uh, have a content ma content management systems to uh, to manage their um, their data uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and have uh, like short to mid terms storage. Other departments don't have those CMSs and they were they are using uh, DRS as a, as a content management system, which uh, makes their life uh, very hard because uh, DRS, uh, you know, uh, moving things across OCFL, which creates a, a version every time you, you change something is not a sustainable way to uh, achieve a short term uh, changes and 
So um, one of the uh, goals of the ERS features is to separate uh, these two parts. Uh, so we want to uh, create a, a workspace, which is a place where uh, users can arrange their contents, uh, work on them for a certain amount of time, keep things um, in, a, in a relatively safe place for, for the short to midterm, and then uh, move things to uh, a proper archive for long-term preservation when things uh, are uh, are settled, and uh, so this this uh, approach provides uh, users with with this space, uh, and uh, keeps uh, OCFL uh, itself focused on on what it does best, which is preservation. Uh, also, that uh, allowed us to to look for solutions uh, that uh, you know that are focused on each of the two areas for you know content management and preservation. Um, we don't have to find the you know the uh, magic bullet, you know the the um, you know a perfect solution that does everything. It could be uh, multiple products that uh, fulfill just uh, either the archive or the workspace part. Uh, the content model is is another area that will uh, uh, will need to expand greatly uh, in the future. Um, we we have a, a very uh, a functioning but uh, as of today limited uh, content model, uh, and we want to uh, be able to to uh, allow more more content types in our uh, repository. Um, with the migration less approach that I mentioned earlier with OCFL, um, we want to uh, first keep uh, backwards compatibility. So create a, a, a content model that uh, that uh, encompasses what uh, what we have currently. So we don't have to move data when we launch the new system. And uh, that way we can defer uh, these, uh, these uh, major content model redesigns uh, post launch, thereby uh, kind of diluting and and uh, and um, uh, staging uh, our uh, repository uh, evolution uh, in in ways that uh, doesn't um, tether uh, content model uh, migration to uh, software updates. Automated task is another um, <clears throat> major topic. Uh, we have uh, a lot of. Um, uh, users who, uh, who are using a lot of their time uh, doing repetitive tasks uh, because the uh, UI UX part of DRS is is uh, not uh, up to the you know the challenges of, of today uh, and uh, um, in order to do that we want to actually take away some of those uh, actions and uh, move them to the background by uh, setting up an event driven architecture uh, that uh, detects changes in the system and uh, and uh, and performs some actions, uh, especially actions that don't need human judgment to the uh, to the background in, in the background. So uh, we are moving some some of these actions to the background and they become uh, part of a of a you know uh, implicit uh, so that the users don't have to explicitly do certain things to preserve uh, their contents. Uh, some of that will be, uh, you know, will be automated. Uh, this um, uh, event-driven architecture, of course, uh, inc increases complexity of our, of our system and uh, uh, will require some labor. But we expect this to uh, to pay off, to to be paid off by um, by the volumes of data that we can move through the system uh, compared to what we are moving through now. Um, Revision in uh, digital preservation for us meaning uh, means that uh, so far we've been uh, uh, preserving the bits and bytes of things. Uh, a lot of the contents we have in in, uh, in store are not very well um, understood. Uh, they are you know preserved, yes, uh, they uh, but uh, they are not very useful uh, because uh, some of the contents are not very well um, uh, indexed or or analyze, you know, we don't really know uh, what we have for many of the objects that we are storing. So we want to make sure that we are preserving not only the content, but also the, the semantic context that surrounds the content. So we can actually, you know, the, one of the uh, purposes of, of digital preservation is to make um, contents available, uh, not only 
only uh, you know not make them go away, but also make them available to users for the long term. Um, so um, we are also acknowledging that uh, archival resources are live materials that change over time. Uh, there is not a final version of anything. Uh, so we are accounting for um, uh, for this evolution. Uh, and, and so we, we implement versioning through OCFL. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that should address the, the fact that, uh, you know, any, any record can be updated at any time and we have to preserve that history. Uh, with that, we also want to facilitate a, a reusing cumulative uh, evolution of information, meaning that new knowledge about any sub subject, any topic, any, any uh, bit of uh, information can be updated. So we want to be able to, uh, would want to enable research and, and enhancements of uh, knowledge about what we have in our uh, repository. Um, we also are uh, want to uh, encourage uh, um, a continuous revolving feedback, and this is a quote from uh, uh, from the uh, OAIS uh, specification, which I won't uh, read out loud uh, in its entirety. Uh, but it uh, pretty much uh, outlines uh, uh, and not as a technical, but a people and processes system that allows uh, for uh, for a continuous improvement of a system by continuous feedback. And what we actually want to do is, uh, while during phase one, phase one we uh, <clears throat> uh, we solicited a lot of, of feedback. We built uh, we built a relationship. We built trust with our stakeholders. We want to maintain that trust and maintain that uh, channel of uh, of communication open, uh, so we can uh, keep developing processes uh, for uh, for a continu continuous and, and an iterative improvement of of what we will. Um, eventually uh, make available to them. Um, so we want to support not only production workflows, but also communication workflows uh, at the same time. And uh, uh, as uh, it's uh, you know obvious, we uh, plan to grow uh, not only uh, the data sets that each of our uh, depositing uh, our stakeholders departments will produce will grow but also we have a lot of <clears throat> departments that we haven't included in uh, in DRS yet uh, we have a large uh, archive of uh, AV materials which we haven't um, preserved yet uh, we are in uh, in this in uh, in talks with uh, research data with the research departments uh, to to store research data <clears throat> and also whole major schools are not using um, the DRS yet. So we each of these three points could um, multiply the, the volume and the complexity of DRS by several fold. And this will um, um, uh, surely uh, lead to unexpected usage patterns and needs that will emerge from, from these increased uh, uh, volumes and increased diversity of, of, of the data. <clears throat> So uh, uh, as I mentioned, the phase one is complete uh, and the key art artifacts for, for it uh, were um, a user requirements uh, catalog from, uh, from, uh, from stakeholders uh, input. Uh, we laid some technical foundation, technical foundational principles and requirements that, uh, that informed uh, uh, most of the technical work. Um, and we made a weighted uh, ma matrix of requirement uh, using the Moscow notation uh, that uh, stands for must, should, could, uh, or want, based based on the need for for a specific feature. Uh, we laid out uh, personal profiles for uh, users uh, of the for future DRS users, and uh, um, are working on an abstract uh, reference uh, content model. And most importantly, we uh, we compiled an RFP that we distributed to uh, potential uh, bidders for um, for the solution or solutions. Uh, we are now concluding uh, phase two, and uh, uh, this is a slide that uh, is an update. Uh, it's it's very succinct because I plan to expand on this with my colleagues uh, in uh, uh, over repositories in 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 Sweden uh, in June. Um, but I just wanted to to give a, a very quick update on on where we are at uh, in in our most current phase. 
so in phase two, we evaluated uh, the RFP questionnaires uh, and follow up, uh, uh, had a follow up Q&A with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, restricted uh, number of, uh, of, uh, um, of bidders. Um, and we are uh, we started to fit uh, the ideal design with, that we uh, we laid out in phase one within the solutions uh, that are in, in our short list. So in this way, we want to envision the workflow and the, and the content scenarios uh, within each solution. Uh, in order to do that, we uh, required uh, some uh, sandboxes from uh, from the uh, RFP um, uh, bidders, uh, so we could test their solutions with our um, with our uh, prospective uh, workflows and and approaches to uh, to the repository. Uh, we conducted uh, reference checks, uh, and uh, we are also shaping the cost model because uh, for the, for the next ten years. Because again, if, if this is a three year project, we also have to um, uh, to predict how how much this is going to cost us uh, in the next ten years uh, from uh, you know uh, licensing, maintenance, uh, you know, custom development, and so on. Uh, throughout the process, process we uh, have been striving to maintain uh, an unbiased position. You know, of course, we're all human; we all have our biases, but also the diversity of our group uh, is very good at, at canceling each other's biases, and we are very, um, very open to criticism and uh, and to eventually come to um, uh, an agreement on on certain you know, points that might be uh, points of attrition. Um, we also hired uh, a software engineer and data engineer and a change manager that uh, the, the first two will uh, ha actually have begun uh, doing some integration work that is independent from the chosen solution. And we will have plenty of uh, other work to, to integrate um, whatever solution we will have with, uh, with the existing architecture. So uh, where we're at where we're at now, we are moving toward a uh, conclusion uh, of, you know, we are moving toward uh, choosing uh, 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 a vendor or, or some vendors for, for the final, you know, for a conclusive solution for DRS. And also we are narrowing uh, our design down to that, uh, to that choice. Uh, we are uh, refining the content model in the same way uh, with uh, with uh, uh, updated information about uh, the the most uh, plausible uh, solution uh, and uh, drilling down the details of of the proposals that have been given us to find out uh, you know whatever might be uh, issues or points of discussion, etc. Um, and we are also designing the replacement of some legacy components that. Uh, of, of DRS, so uh, we're trying to figure out. So if DRS will go down at some point, what will uh, which which functionality we will will we need to uh, replace, and which component of the new system will replace that functionality, or is there not uh, any component that uh, in the new system that replaces that functionality, and we'll have to implement it ourselves. So we're we're going through this exercise. A few conclusions, takes uh, takeaways uh, so far. Uh, uh, my, these are my conclusions uh, that uh, you know allocating time and budget for the first phase, uh, the, the discover phase, paid off a great deal. Uh, we had uh, plenty of of uh, time and uh, and uh, and and discussion to actually uh, know what uh, we are getting into. Uh, as well as approaching the project with uh, an unbiased and fact-driven mindset uh, helped a lot. Uh, as a result of this, actually some uh, unexpected priorities and direction uh, emerged during the discovery phase. For example, the separation of workspace and uh, uh, an archive was not uh, part of the initial uh, project, but it emerged as a, as a primary concern. So it was eventually embedded in the <clears throat> In the in the project and led, and uh, um, uh, steered many of our uh, technical and strategic uh, choices. Um, so having uh, also having an open mind as as we kept uh, also required an open mind from our uh, partners from from uh, the people who uh, are uh, proposing a solution. So uh, uh, we know that we cannot. Uh, uh, 
it's very unlikely that we will have a solution, uh, whether open source or commercial, that will work out of the box. So we need some flexibility from the partners uh, that we are uh, going to to work with to um, to make changes on on either end and and find out the sweet spot between uh, between the two. Uh, and in any case, uh, even with an off-the-shelf solution, we are expecting uh, plenty of, uh, of uh, customization uh, because we have many other systems that are depending on DRS and uh, those systems are not going away. So uh, we are um, expecting to uh, modernize some, some parts, especially um, aligning uh, the interfaces, the APIs to, to modern standards and uh, making things more uh, more predictable and, and better uh, documented. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, post them in the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer. Well, thank you very much, Stefano, for your presentation. Uh, and I would like to thank both of you for uh, really perfectly keeping to time. In fact, we're a little bit earlier. Um, Jose and I'd like to invite you back uh, onto the virtual stage, and then we can transition over to questions. I have quite a few, um, but I've seen that the first question from the audience has already come in, so maybe I'll um, pick that up first. Um, and this is a question, uh, Stefano, for you, um, and it is whether your solution is going to be on-premise or whether it will be cloud-based. Uh, I don't really know how much I can talk about this, but uh, we are still uh, uh, debating uh, which uh, which solution uh, works best for us. Uh, we have at Harvard a policy that uh, uh, constrains us to at least having one copy on premises. Uh, we won't have, um, so we will very likely have a hybrid uh, solution. Uh, cloud is of of course very very convenient. Um, as part of a digital preservation strategy, we want to achieve as much diversity of storage as possible. So uh, diversity of supports, diversity of, um, of platforms, diversity of locations, and diversity of um, uh, providers. So um, we will uh, very likely have a cloud-based, uh, uh, at least some cloud-based, most, maybe mostly cloud-based copies uh, and um and, and one prem on prem uh copy thank you um that was very helpful i have a sort of follow on question that i've been thinking about while you spoke about this um one of the challenges i guess with anything of that scale but also evolving as rapidly as you think you spoke about is future growth and how to model that um could you, Stefano, say a little bit more about how you sort of approach that scenario planning for, for the next years ahead? Um, and ideally, I don't know whether you can, if you could also share something, if you are considering cloud in that context, there's obviously not just the cost for storage, um, but there's also the cost for moving data around, which in some cases can be notably higher. Are you already at the point where you have sort of some ideas on where the growth will go and what that might mean for for budgets and the whole architecture? Um, we have a, a, a billing model with DRS where the individual departments pay for what they store. So um, UIT, the, you know, the Harvard IT department that uh, the host the solutions, does a partial recovery, cost recovery uh, with, uh, you know, through the departments that uh, the, that deposit their uh, their materials, and um, so those departments have to pay for for storage somewhere, right? Um, so um, in, in in that in regarding that, you know, there, there's kind of a um, uh, that problem is kind of spread out uh, across the departments. Uh, our, you know, our main problem will be uh, if the system as a whole, you know, the indices, the uh, the management can can handle um, having terabytes and terabytes or petabytes of of research data added. You know, if now we have two petabytes, uh, we might have uh, ten petabytes in uh, in another few years. So that is a, a complete 
uh, you know, change of scale. And uh, um, we, uh, you know, of course, during our, uh, our RFP uh, process, we uh, inquired about, you know, the scalability of the, of the solutions. And we are uh, looking at, uh, at vendors that can guarantee uh, that have uh, implemented very large uh, repositories. And um, aside from that, there is also, um, uh, you know, there are some talks with the, with the departments uh, that, that are planning to implement uh, to to use DRS as as their uh, preservation backends, uh, you know um, uh, schools that use research data uh, or the AV um, the a AV project um, requires spatial uh, spatial handling and won't be implemented very quickly. They they will need uh, a lot of um, not only not only uh, material time to transfer data, but also organizational and and um, probably some uh, added complexity in the content model as well. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. As we already had quite a bit of uh, preservation, I maybe have a follow on question that is for both of you, um, and this sort of comes directly from me. I'm I'm a historian by training which means I'm used to looking at a historical record that's not complete and just accepting the fact that things disappear. Now we see in preservation, what we're trying is not to make things disappear, um, or at least uh, also to go back to your point to give us a good enough chance that we can rescue most of the material on there. But we are obviously looking at a point where lots and lots of data is generated and it brings up the question, should the aim really be in a research data or collections context to absolutely preserve everything? Or are there principles that we should and could apply by deciding we factor in cost and others, what's sort of worth keeping uh, and protecting to a higher level and uh, what material we might perhaps discard after a while or where at least we might say we are not spending as much effort uh, onto preserving it. And Stefano, as I've asked you now twice in a row, maybe I'll ask that question over to uh, Hussein first, and then then you're welcome to respond. Sure, thanks, Justin. Um, I think this is uh, uh, something a lot of people don't think about. And um, uh, many years ago, my institution was trying to develop some kind of uh, policy on uh, on the kind of digital repository uh, service that Stefano was talking about. Um, and they didn't really know how to think through this. So I made some suggestions to them. And I said, well, uh, we, we need to, to determine who owners of data are and a billing model for the people who own the data. And uh, then we need to decide whether the data has value to those, those original owners of the data. And if the data has value to the institution beyond that, because there needed to be a there needed to be a decision point where somebody who owns the data needs to uh, fund the continuous uh, management of the data and the preservation of the data for some point. But if they're no longer able to, the, the institution then needs to make a decision at a higher level: Do we continue to fund this? Fund some portion of it, and how much of this do we fund indefinitely? And uh, in fact, I wrote this up as an algorithm and I gave it to them and said, here, this is what you should be implementing because it would be the balance between control, management, independence of the, the researchers who have the data, but also not losing the most important things that the institution values. And, uh, you know, as Stefano was talking, I was wondering if you had some uh, system in place like that for the institution to take ownership of the most important things. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you can comment on that. Yeah, well, um, I was gonna say that you know my my opinion is that you know preservation starts at deposit because the information that you put in is what's gonna make it able, you, what's gonna make it useful. You know, the scope of purpose of preservation is not to keep things, but to make things useful and available, right? Uh, but you know, after after hearing you saying, I think that uh, it's even it comes even earlier. It, it is a you know. A, Political and budgeting uh, decision, it, you know, the institution decides what's important, and that might be biased, but uh, it's the best way we can uh, we can achieve preservation because we don't, you know, everybody has finite resources. We have too many um, 
too much data and uh, too little, you know, uh, workforce that to to classify, categorize, and make everything uh, findable uh, in, in detail. So we have to make uh, choices about that. I don't know if that answers your question, Sam. Well, thank you both. I think we can maybe pick that up later again. But I now see that um, we have a few questions coming in on, uh, I think, a really interesting topic that's also very much on my mind. Um, so I'll, I'll combine these questions together. Um, they are all on the environmental impact. So there is partly a question of considering the uh, growth of storage requirements, and I would also argue networking and, uh, and compute requirements, is the environmental impact of these large data repositories that we're building a concern? And this is a question for both of you. And the follow-on question is, how far either of you in your projects and your research are considering the environmental impact and how that could be reduced? And if you do look into it, if you have any recommendations that others could apply. So concerns about the environmental impact, um, how far it factors into your current work and any recommendations that you have for the audience. If you'd like to go first. Um... Shall we change order, Stefano? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the environmental impact is uh, part and parcel of our RFP questionnaire. So we uh, have actually uh, questions for for the uh, for the bidders about uh, their uh, um, how they evaluate uh, environmental impact, how uh, how much environmental uh, concerns are um, you know are you know how. How you know if they have any examples of you know uh, environmental concerns and how they uh, and how they address them in their in their system, uh, in a way you know environmental impact uh, goes hand in hand with resource usage. So more efficient software, more efficient uh, computing, more efficient storage is you know has a lower footprint environmentally. Uh, but yes, we we made it uh, an, an integral part of our of our research process and. Uh, um, to a certain extent, we found out that it's there are not real specific and defined metrics to uh, actually give uh, an actual size to to environmental impact of a of a uh, of a repository. There there are some efforts in this in this sense, but I think it's it's a very um, it's a very active area of research that hasn't you know, is is not uh, needs a lot of improvement and expansion. Thank you, Stefano. So from yeah. that, sorry, yeah. yeah. So I'll just add here that uh, I think Stefano has just said uh, something that's very important for us, which is efficiency, efficient use of resources. And and in the case of building small repositories in low resource environments, or, or any repositories in low resource environments, we just don't have the resources. So resource efficiency is incredibly important. I know that uh, a lot of people who, um, you know, start off, let's say, an early repository, now, not, not on the scale of what Stefan is talking about, but um, many people at institutions start off a repository project by first going out there and acquiring some computing hardware, uh, hiring some staff to do this. And I think that's a very resource-intensive approach, and you don't really need that amount of resources for something that is not a fairly large repository initially, especially when you're starting off. So it should be possible uh, to support a lot of what you want with the bare minimum amount of resources. And I think we have to design for efficient resource use in everything that we do. And this is something we haven't been doing consistently in repository design up until this point. Thank you both. And the efficient use of resources seems to me a good pointer from a whole host of, uh, of perspectives also. Um, from cost. I'd like to sort of maybe take um, take us back briefly from this perspective onto the, the question of preservation and um, rescue of material. A while ago, while I was still in the UK, I was in a discussion on, uh, on preservation of digital collections in the cloud and some 
uh, colleagues involved expressed some concerns about the cloud and others said, well, maybe the cloud might be safer in our local system. And I sort of half jokingly, but only half jokingly thrown in the recommendation to just once a year, take a copy of everything on tape and bury it in a colleague's back garden as both a cost effective, um, fairly secure and hopefully also environmental um, solution. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot in particular since, and you may have seen this a few years ago, um, there was a cyber attack against the British Library that uh, knocked much of its digital infrastructure out. And my former colleagues are now working really hard to bring systems and, and content back online, which I think is a, is a classic case of probably both rescue and, and preservation. So um, what I'm wondering about in this context overall for our repository infrastructure, um, how far have we really designed our repositories for rescue? And I think there's a lot of talk about preservation and say preserving file integrity. Um, but I certainly have not that often been involved in exercises or planning that model for something a bit more drastic uh, and then think about what rescue we're taking. Is this something that we are already doing and maybe it's just passed me by? And if not, how can we sort of apply that kind of thinking most usefully to repositories? Now, maybe at this point, uh, Hussein, if you would like to start and then Stefan, feel free to add in any reflections you might have. Right, I wish I had uh, really good answers to your question, right? but this is a, a topic that, that uh, worries me a lot. I think that uh, the starting point of uh, building the tapes in your backyard um, you know, there was a time when I thought that those uh, optical discs were going to be useful and we would gradually increase the lifetime of those discs and eventually it became something that nobody uses. So you know, what do we have? We have magnetic tape. What's the expected lifetime of magnetic tape? Um, and some people have told me it's something like 30 years. Maybe I'm, I've got that wrong. Um, I think I do have some 30-year-old tapes. I should try them to see if they work. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very worrying because uh, uh, we don't know that the actual bits are going to be preserved, but this is not a problem I'm currently uh, addressing. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, people in the engineering space are going to come up with uh, media that will have a longer lifetime so that the bits can be preserved. Now the question that I want to ask is, if the bits have been preserved, and if somebody comes across my digital collection buried in the backyard and they're able to extract the bits from there, will they be able, will a, will a reasonable technical person be able to reconstruct my archive relatively easily, even if the operating system, software, everything else does not work? And so this is this is kind of the principle that I use in, in the tools that I design that uh, Somebody who knows nothing about this, if they look at it and all they see is plain text, it turns out that a lot of the, the core is plain text. So if you can read plain text in 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, hopefully you can reconstruct this, assuming that we can solve the bit preservation problem. Thank you. Um, Stefano? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I'd argue that um, I. I don't think burying tapes in a backyard is a very environmentally friendly. I I wouldn't eat the tomatoes from that backyard. But um, jokes aside, um, I think uh, Hussein raised a very a very good point. You know, one thing is preserving the contents, and the other thing is interpreting the contents from for, for someone who doesn't know anything about you know they, they can't come across you know this this trove of materials and they don't know how to to interpret them. Um, recently, in the OCFL uh, community, there has been a proposal for for um, a specification uh, enhancement to uh, include some application profiles, uh, which means this is very very um, uh, new. So uh, I don't know where where it's actually going to go, but there is a proposal to include some way uh, at the top of a, of an OCFL file system to provide some instructions, whether human or machine readable about the contents. Because as you might know, OCFL only specifies the folder structure and then there is a content folder that is completely opaque to OCFL. Uh, and this um, proposal is to uh, provide some context about 
those that content folder so that you know anybody who you know digs up this this data can can know uh, how to map them to to some meaningful content uh, but yes, it, it is a it is um, a, a big concern, especially retrieving data. You know, the British Library case is very, very much in a, in our mind these days. That there was a very recent update on on March eighth, I think, about their the process is very, very interesting to read, and that actually led us to some more talks with some storage backend uh, providers uh, about uh, finding a solution that actually is a disconnected copy that is entirely off uh line um and we met we were met with some uh with some surprise because many of these uh storage vendors are you know for the fast cheap uh, option not for disconnected slow tape based uh solution and they wanted to be connected but uh they kind of uh, acknowledged our our point in that you know being disconnected sometimes is is safer at least you know in one instance Thank you. That's very interesting. I am now maybe going to a question that just comes straight in, although I show you everyone else who's put questions and I'll come to you, but this sort of follows directly uh, onto this. We have a question that links to the cyber attack on the British Library. And uh, I'm saying that specifically for you. Um, the question is, are there increased or reduced security vulnerabilities when taking a minimalist approach? Right, so I think this is uh, the, this is tricky because the notion of of uh, building secure systems um, changes over time. So, you know, I would I would have to say that we we can't give up the notion of building secure systems, um, but while keeping in mind the various approaches to building secure systems. Um, what what can we reduce in terms of system complexity, assuming that you've done what you need to do to build a secure system? And you know, I, I have to say, unfortunately, based on all the things that I know, um, our, our systems are, are becoming more difficult to protect over time. And so that security layer is becoming more complex. And this is a problem for people who are working in security to deal with. Um, but once we can somehow manage that security layer, and maybe this is the way that we need to start thinking about it, that security is a layer over the service provision layer, rather than having security and the provision of useful services um, deeply integrated such that we can't separate this, because the complexity of each of these can be controlled independently. And I'm pretty sure the security layer is just going to increase in complexity but uh, I'm hoping that the complexity of the repository layer decreases over time. Yeah. Thank you for this. Uh, I don't know, Stefano, if you have anything to add, but I also have a direct question for you. So feel free to respond to both or only pick one of them. Um, this is a question that is about the discovery of the content. And um, the, the colleague is wondering, Will you have integrations between DRS and the library's discovery services or tools so you can have one search across multiple platforms? Uh, the discovery layer is an entirely different uh, project, uh, but uh, yes, DRS will uh, feed most of that uh, of that discovery layer uh, because that's, uh, I wouldn't say it has everything but it has almost everything and uh it it can provide a, a comprehensive view of of all our contents so uh yes there, there will be integration uh we have some mm, some mongodb uh databases that aggregate um data from drs and from non-drs sources that feed uh the the discovery indices right thank you now, slightly changing tack, I have another audience question uh, on future gazing. Uh, that's, I think, for both of you. What technologies aren't we using in our repository infrastructure that we should be? Or maybe emphasizing the future gazing aspect of this, what technologies might be on the horizon that could be really interesting for repositories that we should consider? 
I'll so I'll take a stab at this first. Um, so there's there's a number of experiments that I have uh, students working on and uh, and future students working on uh, that that are relevant to answer this question. The first is the the fairly advanced data analysis tools that we see coming out of the computational disciplines, the digital humanities, and what I what I'm getting from users of repositories is requests for services that simply do not exist in any repository. And so I've had uh, a few students go off and interview a large number of researchers to find out what are their expectations? What would they like if they could have anything they wanted? Um, and what we are getting is a combination of people who don't really know what's possible and um, others who do know something, but they're suggesting services that we don't really build into most repository tools. So especially um, when it comes to things like discovery, uh, the the way in which people think about discovery uh, is a transition between digital repository tools as we know them, GIS tools as we know them, computational uh, history tools, all combined into one. Uh, and so I think the th there's a lot of uh, potential for really advanced interaction with the repositories. Our repositories are too simple at the moment. The, the second thing I'll mention is um, what, and, and what we've also noticed is that in the last maybe 10 to 15 years, the computational scientists have started to build repositories with massive amounts of data. And uh, these are the people like the astronomers, the physicists, the computational chemists, the climate scientists. And what I have noticed is that they have invented completely different ways of building repositories such that they can deal with very peculiar problems um, like uh, being able to, to slice and dice very large data sets that have very specialized functions. And I think that what, what we can, what we should be doing in the future is learning from what they have developed and incorporating some of those ideas into things like large scale repositories as well. Thank you. Stefano, anything to add from your perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's not a, an IT conference if you don't talk about AI, right? And I, I profess I'm not an AI enthusiast. I'm actually an AI skeptic, but I also acknowledge that there are sites, um, aspects of machine learning that can be uh, very helpful to uh, digital preservation, which is, um, as I said before, uh, helping with the, with the deposit of things and depositing meaningful things. Uh, is very is critical to to the fruition of of those contents later, and you know with with growing scale of of input, uh, you know the the input flow, um, machine learning can help categorize uh, massive amounts of data and and grant more accuracy in the preserve in the in the materials we preserve. So that's something that we've been uh, very much uh, like. Putting out there at the, as a as a very long term uh, goal for when BRS will be operational and and efficient and effective, uh, and we plan to probably run some pilots on on the tagging and categorizing things uh, on deposit uh, and make them more uh, more useful, more meaningful for uh, for future users. I think you touched on a few really interesting points, and I would assume AI will be on the minds, not just of people who are going to technical conferences at the moment. I'll maybe ask a, a question that links into collections and repository that's on our mind. I think here at the University of Chicago, like I would imagine probably many other universities that have uh, a certain amount of, of data and publications, uh, we're being approached by tech companies who want to use our content for training their tools. Now, obviously, some of our content will live out on the internet already, and uh, in particular, open access materials are freely available for most, if not all, use cases. What is your view on how far should we aim to, as widely as possible, make all our content available for AIs to train, or should there be any restrictions or safeguards that we should put up? And 
if you think there are any indications you could give us of what they might look like, it would be really interesting to hear. Him. Well, can I jump in to say I'm also an AI skeptic. <laughs> so uh, I've tried having uh, students do um, automatic classification, well, named entity recognition um, of, of the contents of a historical archive. And uh, it, it works so poorly that, that we are staying very far away from any kind of uh, large language model solution at this point in time. Um, so I, I'm not sure where this AI movement is going, but um, yeah, yesterday, a, a parent of a student uh, went online and uh, they were they were using Bing. They clicked on the co-pilot and they asked uh, they asked the co-pilot a question: Who is Hussein Suleiman? And uh, Bing co-pilot got the answer completely wrong. I think it made some major mistakes in the first sentence, and the parent was completely confused. And this is the only reason I got the query because I had I I was not in any way involved with this particular student. Um, and, and this was from relatively clean data that was available online. And the AI systems were not able to deal with it. I think we have a lot of progress still to be made in producing uh, results that are reasonable and that meet the standards that we, we generally expect. Um, and I'm not sure, given that I see the other side, uh, I see a lot of research where people are building these language models. Um, the the work that people many people are doing seems to be focused on building um, larger language models that can solve a larger amount of problems with a greater accuracy, but will not deal with the absolute requirements that people have when they ask questions. So I think unless until there's a shift in uh, the kinds of machine learning research that that's going on out there until we start to make progress in terms of actually getting us the kind of accuracy that we need, I'm not convinced we should be sharing large amounts of data with these companies that come along asking for the data, because all that it's going to do is it's going to shift the needle very slightly in terms of accuracy, but it's not even going to produce a tool that you can use at your own institution. So I can't, somebody asked me this question yesterday, somebody from our learning technologies group, uh, I can't recommend any AI tool to the university at this point in time because I don't think there are any tools good enough for the teaching and learning enterprise. Well, Stefano, you said you're also an AI skeptic. Uh, I don't know if yeah. you have a different take on, on this question. Slightly different. My skepticism comes not as much from the technical side. I think things will improve as in any research field. You know, AI is very green in, in a way, and it's very, you know, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiasm about it, maybe premature, uh, but uh, I don't see why it shouldn't improve. My skepticism comes from the fact that there are just a handful of companies controlling this, and that's going to concentrate the uh, the control over uh, technology that is extremely uh, important uh, in the hands of uh, a handful of companies. And I'm not going to open the can of worms that uh, there is very a uh, very long discussion. But um, uh, as to the uh, opening uh, libraries repositories to those companies, I I don't really have a problem because if is if libraries. Uh, mission is to make information available to everyone, including for commercial purposes. We could should kind of stick to that decision, except if um, they uh, these companies that use data, our data for commercial purposes, are eventually gonna uh, obscure and and kind of smother through just sheer volume the services that we offer that are unbiased and and free. To everyone, um, so if if that were to happen, I, I would have a problem. But I, I think that uh, as libraries, uh, you know, are free to everybody. Everybody means everybody. I think that's an important point. I was also reminded of this recently in a discussion uh, linked into AI, 
um, where there was a question on whether the access of AI to repository content that has Creative Commons licenses could be reduced. And I think I was the person in that discussion making the point, if you want non-commercial, unrestricted use of your content, then it's very hard to restrict that content. But I know that discussion keeps coming up in different contexts where um, while we embrace the principle, at least, and some of us look at some particular edge cases, or currently it's not even an edge case, and ask, well, was this what we meant originally when we said open to everyone or not? So I think it's an interesting tension that we probably will see come up a few more times on this. And if I may add one little thing about this, uh, I think there is another issue with um, machine learning and AI uh, data sets is that they uh, are mostly... Um, biased or general purpose, uh, commerce driven purposes. So if you feed them library data, most of them won't make sense to them or it would, would be wrong as, as uh, Hussein found out. Uh, th there is no, um, uh, there is no um, library uh, archive uh, museum specific um, data processing for AI. There is a, a AI for LAM, uh, uh, group that uh, is addressing this. And I think that's a very interesting development, meaning uh, developing la large language models for cultural institutions that are more meaningful to us. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a useful reminder. So we're coming to the end of the session, but I think I'll probably take time um, for one more question. Taking a step back from individual repositories, and looking at sort of the wider repository landscape or ecosystem, where in the last few years, there's been a lot of discussion about next generation repositories and making repositories more infrastructure, uh, more interoperable, make it easier to exchange information. So I'll uh, sort of bring this back as a question to uh, both of you. Um, maybe uh, Hussein, starting with you. Do you think a repository infrastructure where lots of individual repositories are built on your simple design approach will be easier to be interoperable or do we then sort of need a more complex layer for data exchange, sharing or discovery? Oh boy, so I have lots of thoughts on this because my, my I started with life just building repositories and then dealing with interoperability. Um, I have to say that I, I think that uh, we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about interoperability of repositories uh, in a long time. And the world has changed. And uh, I, I get the feeling that uh, we, we, need to, we need to pick up this topic again. We, we probably need uh, solutions at multiple levels. So in, in the world, as, as I see it in my head, if we have lots of small repositories. There could be a simple way of developing interoperability among small repositories, but as we scale that up and we create uh, larger systems, we may need more complex systems for interoperability at that more complex layer. So the type of interoperability that we have should match the, the size and the complexity of the kind of repository we are dealing with in some, some kind of natural hierarchical system. Um, and, and I think that might work because I, uh, I haven't yet, and I've done quite a bit of experiments with, uh, with this, I haven't yet been able to figure out how we can build single standards that will work at multiple resolutions in terms of, of scale. So that's, it's still a bit of an open research problem, but, but right now I'm thinking multiple solutions is where we want to go. Thank you. That's a really interesting steer. And from a slightly different perspective, the same question, Stefano, for you. Uh, how much has sort of interoperability, information exchange with other repositories and that sort of thinking around next generation repository paradigm um, influence the approach that you are now taking at Harvard? Um, well, uh... In my previous job at the Getty, we were very linked data friendly. So we, you know, as you know, that the Getty is a provider of many vocabularies that are mm. shared by other um, institutions. So uh, we had a very different approach. At Harvard, we are uh, 
the repository <clears throat> is, uh, you know, feeds our publishing systems, so they, they, that are published, but um, there hasn't been any um, serious discussion about interoperability, uh, especially with other institutions. And th that's something that I have, you know, that's one of my uh, a very a topic that I really uh, am into. Um, but we haven't had any any specific uh, discussion about this. Um, and just one note about, I really appreciated what uh, Hussein said about uh, OIPMH that, you know, developing some standards for interoperability that are as simple as possible, you know, in case of OIPMH that, you know, a developer is able to make an implementation in one day is a critical point for implementing standards, which mean uh, being able to interoperate better.